This is the build up with Balls Ali in partnership with Ladbrokes, where every week we bring you through the big sporting events of the upcoming weekend with our special guest and our special guest returning to the show after a, basically taking Euro 2020 off uh, because we were so busy talking uh, to Kevin Doyle and Gabby Agbon Lahore every day about Euro 2020 is Stephen Ferris. Stephen, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, Mick. I've just went and got myself an office. I'm just you know, I've taken this to a new level. Um, instead of just sitting in the kitchen with the kitchen cupboards behind me, I've started to make an effort. So, uh, no, looking forward to, to the chat, Mick. I suppose it's been a crazy couple of weeks with the British mm. Maris Lions. So, I'm sure we'll get stuck into a wee bit of that over the next 10 or 15 minutes. Absolutely, yeah. It's not all too much since you last. I love the, I like, I, I love the, uh, the uh, frame over the, over the head there. Uh, is there any in particular jersey um, is it, um, fr from your career? Is it a specific one? Yeah, 100th cap actually against ah, Munster. Very good. So, yeah, there's a few pictures. And then the, um, what do you call it? Match day program. Uh, my, my mind's working now. The match day program of that. And me in the front of the match day program. So, no, it's good to have a couple of bits of memorabilia. The wife doesn't like too much up in the house and she's like stevie this isn't a shrine do you like do you know what i mean <laughs> so uh, i have only a couple of bits and pieces about it. but yeah with the, the office set up i would say that put something up i might change it for next week yeah yeah just have something new there every week and see does anybody <laughs> notice that would be the way to go what have we made of the of the line so far it all kicked off a little bit last night when south africa abe borderline put out a springbok team we bet we kind of had maybe nine or ten test starters off both teams playing and it was interesting and the the the, the south africa um won gatlin didn't seem too worried afterwards but just even overall since you know with what's going on in south africa with the covid stuff with everything else how have you kind of has it has it in any way left you cold i suppose as we kind of um still a week and a half out from the first test um, do you know what? The, the first couple of weeks, I just thought it was all a bit of a nonsense. Um, the way that it sort of panned out with the COVID cases coming out. And I know like everybody's given their opinion and their tuppence worth of what should happen to the tour and what way it should go and should it be brought over to the UK and should it be finished out and, and everything else. But I think for me at the start of the tour when all this was happening was the player safety. Um, you know, people coming down with COVID. We're not really 100% sure of the long-term effects of COVID. Um, we've all heard about it, long COVID. What exactly does that mean? Um, and when you hear of the professional rugby players getting uh, testing positive, then, of course, your mind starts to wonder, Mick, and you're starting to go, geez, I hope they're going to be okay and everything else. And then in South Africa, it's, it's very different on the ground to what it is here uh, in terms of the cases. And I know the hospitals and everything on the ground over there are really struggling and you know, the pandemic seems to be in full flow over there, Mick. We're here. We, we, there's this feeling amongst everybody that we're sort of on our way out of it. So, yeah, I think in, in terms of leave the rugby aside, Mick, um, I, I think there was a part of me that wanted the tour to be either cancelled or postponed or, you know, just moved away so everybody could get themselves fit and healthy and then restart the tour. But fair play to everybody. Um, all the management the coaches and staff of, of, of each of the South African team and the British and Irish Lions team. Everybody at the minute seems fairly fit and healthy. Now this could change tomorrow or yeah. in a few hours time as, as you and I both know but at the minute it looks a hell of a lot better compared to where it was a week 10 days ago um, and if they can maintain that then hopefully we'll have a competitive Lions series which kicks off next Saturday and um, you know we're all thoroughly looking forward to that. Yeah, and I suppose last night's game did add a lot to that in terms of um, feeling more like a real tour. You know, and I, it's not as if they don't always have the warm-up games where they win by 50 points, but, but I think with everything hanging over it, there was nothing to really grab the attention, whereas last night's game really did. What did you make of it? It was like it was some very hard-hitting stuff to South Africans reminding us, I suppose, of this Springbok team that we haven't seen really since the 2019 World Cup final and thinking like, this isn't going to be an easy <laughs> three deaths for the Lions by any means. No, not at all. And it's uh, it's funny, like you, know, you read through social media, you know, especially over the last couple of weeks, the Lions have put uh, the Sigma Lions and the Sharks to the sword. Um, I know the Sharks held in there for a half a rugby against them, but you know, they've been destroying everything in front of them. And they've got the Stormers this weekend and they'll probably rack up another 30 or 40 
uh, points of, uh, in that game. But when it came to the crunch uh, against a pretty good South African side, they went into their shells a little bit in the first 20 minutes. I really think that the South African brutality and physical aggression that they showed um, caught them cold um, and they weren't ready for it. And, the, you know, two, three, four men gang tackles uh, didn't matter if they were leaving themselves short in the defensive line. They just wanted to win the game line and win the collisions. And they did that for large parts of the game. Um, and I was very, very impressed. Of course, they were going to run out of steam. Of course, they were going to kick, start kicking the ball and try and close the game out. It was always going to happen, uh, especially playing with you know, for, for 10 minutes with 13 men. Uh, you know, it was going to be inevitable that it was going to happen. But fair play. It was a really good, uh, for me, it was a test match, the, the, the physicality that was shown. And after the game, I feel like it was much more beneficial to the South Africans than to the Lions because they got a good head out. They got a win. You know, everything's um, hunky dory in their camp now. They're, they're, they're moving forward. They've got the momentum with them. The fans now are realizing that, uh, you know, their, their squad's healthy and, and, and they're moving in the right direction. Razi Erasmus, water boy or not a water boy. He didn't seem to be carrying too much water, but he was there giving them me- messages. Their set piece specifically, their mall looked pretty good. I know the Lions disrupted their scrum a few times, but uh, the South African team have got a couple of. Pretty good props to come in um, and sort that out next weekend. But, yeah, it, it was a great game, brilliant game, very, very tight. The Lions switched their, their mindset in the second half, didn't just try and take them on up front and run into brick walls. They kicked the ball a hell of a lot more, got a bit of change out of that. And if you can remember back to the Rugby World Cup semi final, that's the tactics that Wales employed, and they got so much change out of it and could actually win that semi final against uh, you know, the World Cup winner, South Africa. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting week. Get the Stormers over with, and then it's all guns blazing for the Test match, Mick. Yeah, absolutely. wonder what you think in terms of kind of what Gatland will have learned um, from yesterday, personnel-wise, because, you know, if you look even in the second row, I think we would have all kind of said coming into it that, you know, not realizing that Alan Jones was on his way back, that you know, you're talking about who's going to play beside Ian Henderson in my head, anyway. You know, and it's like Will Marrow told you re- re- rediscover that form of 2019, and then you play at these test match level, as you said, and against the incredibly physical South Africans, and you see Marrow told you being back to what he was, and maybe Henderson not having that kind of game in a tighter. Um, environment and then that then you start asking the question of like you know is Gatlin going to be taking a lot more from what we saw last night than he will from the overall tour together and I'm not I don't mean to single out Ian Henderson it's just I suppose there's there's a worry there for me as it's a, an Irish starter in the test team and suddenly you've got Jones back you've got a Toji in form you've got the likes of um, Adam Baird coming off the bench and having a, a stormer in the exact way that a second row will have to have against the spring boxes in terms of counter modeling and defense and in the tight locking basically but he has to make he has to because the level of competition is so much higher against the south african a team or south african yeah. box whatever you, you want to call that side like you know again the, the tom curry um you know watson debate there as well mm-hmm. hamish watson um a few other players one farrell that played brilliantly in this last match but when it went up another level is he at the um is he the the 10 to take this team forward in my opinion at the minute off the back of that performance probably not and like i was on the phone to a good friend of mine mark robson who does a lot of commentary uh, as you know on 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 all the games and watches every single minute of every single rugby match and the question that i asked him we were chatting about second rows making the question i said was what does ian henderson give you that adam beard doesn't that johnny hill doesn't and that alaman jones doesn't and he said well maybe a little bit of footwork, you know, before contact. And I said, yeah, but like a little bit of footwork before contact against the Russian defense is gang tackling two, three, four man tackles. You know, it's, it's, it's probably not going to mean anything. So like, I think Handy now is, is going to find it really tough to break into the test team mm-hmm. uh, just off the back of that performance. Um, he didn't, you know what, Mick? He didn't play badly. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, we're critiquing him here and, and sort of picking holes in his performance. But that's what you got to do now at this at this level. And it's only a um, you know a week and a half away from a test match. Is you know what guys did stand up to the the 
the Ed Sebastian and the Mustard, you know, who really put it to them. And you can say I told you did. I know I told you gave away a couple of silly penalties, um, especially the one at the end. Um, for me, it was definitely in at the side all day all day long, even though Nigel Owens and Coventry said it wasn't. For me, it definitely was a penalty. So, so Hendy now finds himself in a, in a position where a week ago we were singing his praises, thinking he was going to start. And now, you know, Adam Baird comes on and, and plays brilliantly well. And, you know, if Johnny Hill goes well this weekend and Alan Wynne jones the tour captain, lands back in South Africa, surely he has to be involved in the match day 23 in some shape or form. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy how quickly things can turn, Mick, in, in the space of only a few days from game to game. Yeah, absolutely. The centre then, I suppose, is the other thing that I, I would consider wide open. I think if we talked four weeks ago, we would have said it's Robbie Henshaw plus one. Then Robbie Henshaw misses four games. It is good to see him named on Saturday's team. Gatlin said if he was a push, he could have made it last night, but what's the point in risking it? So, you know, you have to think he's going to be back um we'll see how he gets on on saturday but who's if then who is playing alongside him is is on farrell are they going to play two out halves probably unlikely at this stage you would think then harris i don't think had the greatest game last night bundiaki has played in every game so far and elliot daly is obviously a favorite of um of of gatlands and and you know played well when he came on on the wing last night but i who is i suppose it's the most i don't know i don't ever remember seven that whatever it is nine days out from a lions test match where you have an entire part of the field where it's just up in the air we don't have a clue what's going to happen yeah is uh is brown driscoll fit <laughs> <laughs> get him out there uh yeah it, nobody's sort of grabbed the 12 and 13 jersey i think bundy's been consistent enough um like slipped off a few tackles in the, in the lions game when he played um Again, I would love to be talking about guys in the centre who have went out there and really seized their opportunity, and and, and none of them really have. I'm, I'm super excited to see how Robbie Henshaw goes this week. I think his performances during the Six Nations, he was a, an absolute boulder for the tour and probably a boulder to start uh, the, the first Lions Test match, but you know, injury sort of hampered him a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, Elliot Daly, you know, he's, he's a great outside break on him. He's a cultured left foot. Doesn't make too many mistakes. Uh, maybe his tackling can be uh, criticised at times. But no, Mick, I can't turn around and say to you, look, I think they're nailed on to start. And I'm not sure Warren Gatlin has that either. It wouldn't surprise me if, uh, if Dan Beggar started at 10 and, and yeah. uh, Owen Farrell started at 12. Like, it wouldn't surprise me. The way that the Lions are able to get the South Africans on the edge, if they can get an extra... Um, set of hands in there to get the ball wide. They certainly can cause the South African team trouble. It's just getting it there is the problem. This up and in defence is so hard to, to, to bypass. Um, but if they can do that, they'll, they'll create opportunities. Maybe he wants the guy, but he just looks a little bit low in confidence or something. And you know, not captain. And you know, Conor Murray is maybe something else you want to talk about. Not our captaining at the weekend. He's been called skips for the last three weeks. Then all of a sudden, Alan Jones comes in. He's no longer called skips and he's um, not playing particularly well and people are now questioning should he be starting the first test. So, yeah, it's uh, it's all a bit of a mishmash at the minute, isn't it? What do you think about that dynamic with Murray and then how, if, if at all, it's affected his form? Because obviously he was playing the best rugby he'd been playing in a couple of years at least um, at the start of the tour and all the way, like, you know, at the end of Ireland, the Munster season. But then... You know, he he came off the bench in the previous game. You know, made a couple of mistakes, and then obviously captain the team to the start yesterday and had a poor, poor game by his standards. Really, you know, like I don't know if anybody is there to replace him in the way that the Lions are playing, um, with the amount that they're kicking and the amount and and the kind of more physical style that they want to play against South Africa. But at the same time, this isn't the Conor Murray of whatever the the, the 2020, 21 season that we've seen so far. Yeah. I think it's really tough on him. Like, make it, like if, I, if I was announced as captain of the Lions, being wheeled out in front of the media, you know, doing all the duties, what a, an unbelievable privilege and honour it, it is to captain the British and Irish Lions. And then, like, two and a half weeks later, for it to be taken away from me again, because, like, Alan Wynne Jones is coming out to South Africa. He's probably already landed as we were chatting. And he's going to become the tour captain once again. So, 
I know the captaincy changes from week to week. Or whoever's taking the pitch is Stuart Hall captaining the, the lads this weekend uh, from fullback against the Stormers. And that's that's a huge honour in itself. But actually be given that armband for the tour and then for it to be taken away, it just like if I was Conor Murray, I wouldn't be too happy about it. Uh, <clears throat> even though he's putting on a brave face and like he's coming out and saying all the right things, of course he's gonna do that. But yeah, part of me wouldn't wouldn't be too too happy with it. Um and that's the way it goes. Like Warren Gatlin makes big decisions, big times. We all remember dropping Brian O'Driscoll, leaving him out of the test team. You know, there was a media frenzy over that, um, and he got through that obstacle okay. Um, he's made a few big calls in his time as, as head of the Lions and as head of, uh, of Wales. Not bringing Johnny Sexton was another huge um, point on, on out on this tour. So, like, he's got very few big calls wrong, Mick. Um, yeah. So, like, you got to probably back this one. Um, feel sorry for Conor Murray at the same time. But maybe this might be a weight off his shoulders that he can yeah. kind of get back and just go out and play his own game and not have to talk to the referee as much and you know, leave that down to whoever's alongside him with the captain'sy armband. So yeah, um, well, we'll we'll soon find out, Mick. <laughs> we'll soon find out if it's a good decision or not. If Murray is there, right, you, know, you would probably nail him on. If you're to say, then going through yeah. the team, you're looking at maybe Furlong, a Toji, probably Falatau still, and. You know, I would say in, in Gatlin's mind, at least Tom Curry one way or another, either at, at six or seven. You're talking about Dan Bigger, I would think, at this stage, whether Farrell plays at 12 or not. And you're talking about Anthony Watson. I would say, is are they the only ones that we would say are nailed on at this stage? When you were there in 09, I know you got injured close enough to this time, but you yeah. were still there through the first test. Now, it's not as if Ian McGeekin was telling you guys, here's the test 15, but you would have a sense of it in the camp. Did you have a sense of more than six places nailed on? Come uh, the week no, like, so, so it was exactly the same. I get injured against the Cheetahs. Then the following week, it was against uh, Penn against the Sharks um, in Durban. And then it was a one-week break until the test. So it's exactly the same situation that I sort of find myself in. Mm. I, I get injured like probably a few days ago, if that makes sense. Um, and... I remember going to the Sharks game on crutches and then, you know, got back on my feet and went to the first test and watched it just as a spectator. Honestly, Mick, I had no idea where my place was in the squad, if I was in Ian McGeegan's reckoning, if I was going to... Uh, I knew I was playing well, of course, mm -hmm. like Anthony Watson, Tom Curry, Atoji, Furlong, they know they're playing well. They, they know that they're going to be in with a shout. That's the way I felt. It felt like it was going to be in with a shout, but there was never any, you know tap on the shoulder or a quiet conversation with any of the coaches, never mind the head coach to say, you know, keep up the good work, you know, keep ahead time, we'll, you know, keep yourself fresh, recover well, well, you'll hopefully be involved in the, in the test squad. There was never any of that. So I think after this Stormers game, the lads will have a fairly good idea where they're at um, and where they stand. Um, and as a player, you probably want that getting into the week pretty early on, you know, mm. on that you are going to be, it's more mentally getting your head around what actually it means to, to play a test game at the, at the highest level, the pinnacle playing for the British Irish Lions. So, yeah, um, back in 2009, not a clue, but uh, I think me, you and I can definitely spot four or five lads that's going to be um, on that test starting 15. And somebody else that I would throw in there is, you didn't mention him, I know, is Josh Adams. I think Josh Adams in one wing, and Anthony Watson on the other wing is a, is a pretty sure thing at the minute. Okay. And, and hopefully they can start, you know, keep scoring more and more tries. Yeah, I actually, I, I actually had Van der Merva as somebody that like he's just been he's been so good in all his performances. And he's playing again at the weekend. You know, I just wonder would that mean that he will uh, he will get the nod? But maybe jo Josh Adams has been outstanding, I suppose as well. But just in terms of definites, and you would imagine with Williams now in a HIA that you're probably are going to see Hog more or less, you know, at least for week one, probably starting. But we'll see how that goes as well. There's definitely a lot of discussions to be had all over the field. And we'll talk about when, once we get these Stormer, the Stormers game out of the way, we'll see, do, does Henshaw come? Does Jones get through it? Uh, you know, do lads shine? Is there another injury or two? You never know. So when we're having this conversation next week, we'll be picking our team close enough to when Gatland is picking his, I guess, you know, and we'll be a little bit surer of the lay of the land. But if I was to stop you on one more position, and that's the back row, 
we've mentioned there already that Hamish Watson, in a kind of a similar way uh, as we were talking about to maybe Henderson, um, although he wasn't playing last night, I think importantly for Watson, you know, it's like, you know, they've been the star, they've been the flat track bullies in a way so far this year and how can they step up but we won't get a chance to see Watson in that but does he keep that place did he ever have it Tom Curry comes in the big game and does what you know he can do there was talk on the TV coverage yesterday that maybe you play Curry at six and Watson at seven and you have somebody like Ty Burn or maybe even Laws and Burn as you play you, you know you have an extra forward on the bench and you can have more options there so I'd be just intrigued to know what you think I think Jack Conan has been very very impressive so far as well but it's just it's unlikely to you know, Toby Faldell hasn't done anything wrong and he seemed like he was just so far ahead in that position. But it, yeah. I, I'm fascinated to know because it is, it's it's wide open as well in a way. If, even if it's just one position, it could be six or seven that's available. Yeah, like for me personally, I think the, the set piece is such a huge thing um, against the South, South Africans. You need bulk, you need size, you need power and um, you need a good line-out option at six. You know, you Rewind the clock back to 2009. Tom Croft got the nod. He was a brilliant player around the list, but what a line-out option he was. Um, and he could, you know, qu you could quickly turn to short main line-outs, keep Falatai out in the midfield, where he's really good at Tom Curry or Hamish Watson in the midfield as well, and have unbelievably strong launch plays, starter plays that uh, can, can get these guys over the gain line. So I think he has to go with a big six. When I say big, I mean somebody who's, very, very um, astute in the line-out, um, can run a line-out himself if, uh, if things get tough. So the likes of Courtney Laws, Tagburn, both have played in the second row for, for Munster uh, and Northampton, respectively. So, uh, yeah, I think you know one of those two is going to probably start at six. When you come to the seven jersey, at the minute, just because of the level of opposition, I have to go with Curry. Um, and I know Hamish Watson uh, has been played unbelievably well, but I just, you know, I just see that Tom Curry does everything that Hamish Watson does with just an extra couple of percent on the end of it, and that's the way I see it. And the way Hamish Watson likes to roam around a bit more, he is a bit more of a free spirit when he plays, and uh, might go a little more off script. Maybe the last 20 minutes, half an hour of a game will suit him better um, than Tom Curry. Uh, so, yeah. Like, that's the way I look at it. I think you're right about Falatai. It's all about getting the combination right, making sure that they work well together. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this back row goes this weekend. You know, I'm sort of ruling out Jack Conan. I don't know why, but I just think if you're going to have somebody on the bench, I'm not sure that you're going to have Jack Conan on the bench. No. Ahead of a couple of the other lads. So, yeah, it needs a really big performance by him. And he's got it in his locker. He has 100% got it in his locker. He's a brilliant, brilliant player. But we just need to see it. You know, we need him to be head and shoulders above all the rest of the, the British and Irish Lions players on Saturday afternoon when they take on the Stormers for him to be given a chance because Warren Gatlin knows Toby Falatai inside and out, knows he performs on the big occasion and has trust and faith uh, for him to deliver. So, you know, Jack's going to have to try and deliver him himself this Saturday. Yeah, and hard to put a specialist eight as one of your bench players as well, isn't it? Because there's not enough variation there. So it's all fascinating. I think I think last night really set it alive a little bit. It turned it up, turned up the volume. It, st it stopped, you know, it, it was a little bit in the background for some of us, I have to say, with, with the Euros and everything else going on. But, you know, the Lions were just going out beating teams for 50 points. What we saw last night then, a defeat, I think, Goran Gatlin said it might have done the Lions no harm. I think it might have done the tour no harm in terms of yeah. everybody paying attention and turning the light on. So hopefully it's a good game at the weekend and we'll uh, we'll catch up next week as well and, and maybe see what that test team's going to be. Super, Mick. Thanks very much. Cheers for having me on. Thanks a million, Stevie. Um, don't forget, of course, um, thanks a million to Ladbrokes, as always, uh, here on the build-up. If you are having a bet on the Lions, on anything else at all in the world of sport, please always gamble responsibly. Visit dunlouis.net for more information. We'll be back with you with more build-up with Stevie as we look ahead to the first test of the Lions. It's really getting going now for the next few weeks, um, and we'll be back with him next week uh, right here. So stay with us.